Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to cover chapter 8 for MCAT Biology. This chapter is all about the immune system. Now we're going to cover several topics and objectives in this chapter, so let's go over what the main topics of this chapter are going to be. The first thing we're going to talk about is the structure of of the immune system. We're gonna talk about innate versus adaptive immunity, and we'll talk about the anatomy of the immune system as a whole as well. Our second objective is to focus on the innate immune system. This is gonna include a conversation about non-cellular, non-specific defenses, as well as the cells of the innate immune system. The third objective is then focusing on the adaptive immune system. Here we'll talk about the cells of the adaptive immune system. We're also going to discuss activation, recognition, and immunization. And last but not least, in, the, in this chapter, we're going to talk about the lymphatic system. We'll discuss the structure and the function of the lymphatic system. Fantastic. So those are our four big objectives that we're going to cover in this chapter. Structure of the immune system innate immune system, adaptive immune system, and then the lymphatic system. Let's go ahead and get started with the first objective and talk about the structure of the immune system. To start, we know that each day the human body, your body, is exposed to numerous bacteria, viruses, fungi, and even parasites. Yet, our bodies are able to protect us from infection most of the time. Even when we do get sick, the immune system is usually able to contain and eliminate the infection. And so then the question that rises is, well, how exactly does that work? Well, in order to fight infection, the human body has two different divisions of the immune system. We have the innate immune system and we have the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is, this is our body's first line of defense against invaders. It's always ready to attack. It's non-specific, meaning that it doesn't differentiate between the different types of pathogens, but it's just ready to attack when needed. All right, so kind of imagine it. This is maybe a little reduction, but, uh, reductionist, but imagine it as the body's general security system that's always on the lookout for intruders. And when there's intruders, it makes sure to keep them out and, and, and fight as best as possible. All right, so that's our innate immune system. That's innate immunity. What about adaptive immunity? This system's more specialized. It remembers specific invaders from previous encounters, and that allows for a quicker and more targeted response during subsequent interactions. Think of it as like your body's specialized task force. They have all the fire, uh, all the files on previous invaders. All right, and their specialized task force that is prepared and has studied how to attack and protect against various invaders. All right, it's like a body specialized task force that's trained to recognize and deal with specific threats based on past experiences. Now, when we talk about the immune system as a whole, we've, we've said that there's two parts, innate and adaptive immunity. But we can also talk about how, we can talk about the anatomy of the immune system, all right? And how the immune system, all right, is not confined at a particular location. So unlike some of the other systems in our body that we've covered, the immune system is dispersed in the body. It's a network of cells, tissues, and organs that are working together to, de def to defend the body. And there are several parts to it that we want to discuss here so we can look at this diagram here we could see how dispersed different important components of the immune system are just looking at this figure all right a couple of things we want to talk about bone marrow this is where all the leukocytes the white blood cells originate and these cells are essential players in the immune system another important component the spleen Apart from storing blood, the spleen, it plays a very crucial role in activating B cells. And we'll cover B cells and T cells when we talk about adaptive immunity in the third objective. These cells, they mature into plasma cells that will produce antibodies for the adaptive immune system. 
All right. Another important thing to talk about is the thymus. It's located near the heart. All right, and this is where T cells mature. These cells are really central, again, to the adaptive immune system. They coordinate immune responses and they attack infected cells. All right. In addition, lymph nodes play an important role in the immune system. These nodes filter lymph, which is a fluid containing white blood cells. They serve as a communication hub for immune cells, and they're the sites where B cells can be activated. Another important part is the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, also known as GALT, all right? Found near the digestive system, all right? Found near the digestive system, these tissues like the tonsils, adenoids, the payers patches, etc., they um, are frontline defenses against ingested or inhaled pathogens, all right? Now, just as a quick note, all right, and going back here to this innate versus adaptive immune system, the mammalian immune system, we said, has these two over overarching divisions, innate and um, adaptive. Now, the innate acts near entry points into the body. It's always ready to attack. It's not specialized, but it's ready to attack. It plays as a defense, all right? If it fails to contain a pathogen, Right, the adaptive immune system kicks in, all right, mounting a later but highly targeted attack against the specific invaders. Now, in the innate immune system, this system includes, among other components, antimicrobial molecules and various phagocytes. These are cells that ingest and destroy pathogens. These cells, like dendritic cells and macrophages, which we'll cover in the second objective, they also activate an, an inflammatory response, and they secrete proteins called cytokines that will trigger an influx of immune cells from the blood. And among the recruits are more phagocytes, all right? Notably ones that are called monocytes, which can mature into macrophages, and neutrophiles, all right? So monocytes and neutrophiles, big, big roles here, all right? Then in the adaptive system, like we said, this kicks in a little bit later, but it's a highly targeted attack against the specific invader. This system features B cells and T cells. Activated B cells secrete antibody mo molecules that bind to antigens, specific components that are unique to a given invader, and we'll de redefine antigens later as well. All right, and they destroy the invader directly or they'll mark it for attack by others. Now, T cells, they recognize antigens that are displayed on cells, and some T cells are going to help activate B cells and other T cells. All right, T cells and B cells, they spawn memory cells that promptly eliminate invaders that the system has encountered before. All right, now, as we mentioned um, earlier, and in previous chapters, leukocytes are white blood cells and they're produced in the bo bone marrow through a process called hematopoiosis. Leukocytes or white blood cells, they form the backbone of our immune system. All right. They can be broadly categorized into two categories. We've talked about this in the previous chapter as well, but it is a good reminder. All right. It can be categorized as granulocytes. Um, named for the granules in their cytoplasm, and agranulocytes, all right, named for the lack of granules in their cytoplasm. Now, granulocytes have granules. These cells contain enzymes that can target and destroy pathogens, and some examples of them include neutrophiles, eosinophiles, and basophiles. Agranulocytes, they fall, um, they are critical for adaptive immunity. Um, they lack granules in their cytoplasm. A kind of a granulocyte is a monocyte, which morph into macrophages that devour pathogens. Now, the takeaway for this first objective where we've defined innate and adaptive immune, uh, immunity, and we've talked about the parts of the immune system, the takeaway here for objective one in simple terms is that innate immunity is our immediate generalized defense mechanism and in contrast, adaptive immunity is a learned response that's going to provide a more tailored defense against specific pathogens. Now, we've broadly talked about 
adaptive and innate immunity. The next two objectives, we're going to focus on each in great detail. All right. And so the second objective is all about innate immune system. We're going to talk about non-cellular specific defenses, and we're going to talk about the cells of the innate immune system. All right. So here, remember that the innate immune system consists, consists of cells and structures that offer non-specific protection. All right. These non-specific defenses are cellular and non-cellular. And we're going to start by talking about non-specific defenses that are non-cellular. All right. Now, our first line of defense is our skin. Our body is equipped with an array of non-cellular, non-specific defenses that act as the first line of resistance against many potential invaders. And at the front of that, all right is our skin. Our skin is the largest organ and it functions as a primary barrier with its multi-layered structure blocking many kinds of pathogens. Now, as the skin sheds its layers, it effectively removes many of those trapped invaders. And beyond just being a physical barrier, the skin also produces antimicrobial uh, peptides called defensins, which also helps protect us from pathogens. These peptides, also combined with the lysosome presence in sweat, disrupt the membranes of pathogens and it hinders their growth on the skin's surface. And that is one of our first lines of defense. All right. Now, parallel to this, our respiratory system our respiratory system provides a secondary, uh, a secondary line of defense. The respiratory tract is lined with this viscous mucus that captures many airborne pathogens. Um, and like we've mentioned when we talked about the respiratory system, there's these tiny hair-like structures known as cilia that line the path uh, the, the, these passages that make up our respiratory tract. They, they move in a rhythmic way. They propel the mucus along with any ensnared particles upward for expulsion or ingestion. Now, in addition to that, in addition to our skin and our respiratory tract, our eyes and mouth also serve as gateways that pathogens might exploit, but they are not defenseless. Um, they're not defenseless. Uh, lysozyme, an enzyme that's produced by the lacrimal glands of the eyes, and also it's found in our saliva, they actively break down the peptidoglycan layer of bacterial cell walls, which out offers yet another layer of protection against pathogens. All right, so we talked about the skin. We talked about our respiratory tract. We talked about the mucus on mucus membranes that traps pathogens. We talked about tears and saliva. All right, these are all non-cellular, non-specific defenses. Also, to add to that list, we have the gastrointestinal tract that plays a dual role in defense. So the stomach secretes highly acidic gastric juice with very low pHs, very acidic think 1.5 to 3.5. This acidic environment is pretty lethal for many pathogens that might be ingested with food. Now, in addition, our intestines, they, are, they, are, they already have um, bacteria. Our, our, our intestines contain beneficial bacteria. These microbes, they aid in digestion. That's usually what you learn, but they're not just aiding in digestion. They also outcompete many potential pathogens for resources, and that effectively pre uh, prevents their colonization and growth in our intestines. All right. And just when you think, oh, wow, that's a lot. Well, the defenses don't end there. Circulating in our bloodstream is a complex site, uh, a set of over 30 proteins that are part of a system called, sorry about that, the complement system. All right, these proteins that can rapidly uh, be activated and initiate a cascade of reactions that results in things like cell lysis and inflammation and opposin uh, opsonization, which marks pathogens for destruction by phagocytes. All right, now while they operate broadly and they don't specifically target individual pathogens, 
their rapid response is, is very, very important. All right. So in addition to the fact that our skin protects us, um, our our respiratory tract protect, uh, protects us, our tears and saliva protects us, our stomach and intestines protect us. We also have now this complement system that is a array of a, a number of proteins in our blood that further acts as a defense mechanism. So we really have a law of non specific non-cellular defense mechanisms. Now, in addition to that, we also have interferons, all right? When our cells are infected by viruses, they sound the alarm by producing interferons. These proteins don't just remain in the infected cell, they communicate with neighboring cells, signal, uh, signaling them to bolster their antiviral defenses. In addition, interferons, they activate nearby immune cells, prompting them to attack and destroy pathogens, all right, to destroy infected host cells, all right. This coordination ensures that the spread of the virus is contained, all right, and, and, and taken care of. So together, all these non-cellular, non-specific defenses form a very robust, and comprehensive protective network that ensures that our body remains a fortress against a plethora of potential invaders, all right? And that is just our non-specific, non-cellular defenses, all right? Now, what we can talk about also, all right, is our, the cells of our innate immune system, all right? This is going to be very important. So let's scroll down here. All right. Many of the nonspecific defenses are also cellular. All right. So let's discuss this further. What happens when bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites breach these defenses we just talked about? Well, the cells of the innate immune system are always ready to attack. And so now let's talk about how many of the nonspecific defenses, all right, let's talk about how these nonspecific cellular defenses come into play. All right, in our exploration of the immune system, we cannot um, emphasize enough the vital role of macrophages. Originating from blood-borne monocytes, these adrenalocytes once they migrate to various tissues, become part of a resident population. It's, incre it's intriguing how specialized they can become based on their location. So for instance, in the central nervous system, they're known as microglia. Uh, within the skin, they take the name of Langerhans cells, and in the bone, they're termed osteoclasts. Now, when bacterial invaders breach our body's defenses and they enter tissues, macrophages swing into action. And their response is systematic and highly efficient. First, through a process called endocytosis, they engulf and internalize the invader. Once internalized, they utilize, so that's the first step, all right, once Internalized, they utilize a plethora of enzymes to digest and break down the pathogen. All right. And then third, all right. Third, they further take pieces of the digested invader. All right. And display them on their cell surface using a protein complex known as the major histocompatibility complex. All right. Let's repeat because this is very important, all right? The activated macrophage does three things, all right? It does three things. Phagocytizes the invader through endocytosis, all right? Then it digests the invader using enzymes, all right? And then presents little pieces of the invader to other cells using a protein called the 
major histocompatibility complex or MHC. All right. So that's how I'm going to refer to it. All right. MHC. Fantastic. So there, this MHC can be broken down into two complexes. All right. Two complex, uh, two complexes, class one and class two. So let's discuss each. MHC class 1 molecules are ubiquitous. They're found on almost all nucleated cells. What's their primary role? To display endogenous antigens, all right, proteins from within the cell. All right. Their primary role is to display endogenous antigens, proteins from within the cell. This continuous presentation allows the innate immune system to constantly monitor all right, this, uh, this continuous presentation allows the immune system to constantly monitor cellular health so that it can ensure that no intracellular pathogens like viruses have taken over. All right, should an unfamiliar protein be presented, it serves like an alarm. All right, it's, it, it breaches the system, alarms go off. All right, so it serves as an alarm signaling cytotoxic, uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes to address the affected cell. All right, so that's class 1 MHC. What about class 2? MHC class 2 molecules are a bit more exclusive in their distribution. They're primarily displayed by what we term as professional antigen presenting cells. It's a group that includes our macrophages. And their job is to present exo, uh, exogenous antigens, or those that originate from outside the cell. This pathway plays a vital bridge between the innate and adaptive immune system, rallying a more specialized response when needed. All right, so here's the key takeaway. Major histocompatibility complex molecules are joined with antigens. The MHC antigen complex then goes to the cellular surface to display the antigen. This allows the immune system to monitor the health of cells. MHC1 is in all nucleated cells and it presents endogenous antigens. MHC class two is an antigen presenting, uh, is an antigen presenting cells and it presents exogenous antigens. All right, so that is the difference between Major histocompatibility complex, class 1 and class 2. All right, this is really important. And if it's okay, I'm going to repeat all the important points from, from this section. All right, we started by saying that there are nonspecific defenses that are cellular. Macrophages, they ingest pathogens and they present them on major histocompatibility complex molecules. All right. MHC class 1 is present in all nucleated cells and displays endogenous antigen to cytotoxic T cells. MHC class 2 is present in professional antigen presenting cells, all right, and it displays exogenous antigens to helper T cells. All right, fantastic. Now, macrophages, um, Macrophages and dendritic cells also have special receptors known as pattern recognition receptors. All right, they're best described. Uh, the, the best described um, is the toll like receptor, but these pattern re recognition receptors are also able to recognize the category of the invader. Oh, is it a bacteria, a virus, a fungus, a parasite? And this allows for the production of appropriate cytokines to recruit the right type of immune cells. Each immune cells has different weapons that can target particular groups of pathogens. All right, so that's another important non-specific defense that is cellular. All right, macrophages, um, they also secrete cytokines and so do dendritic cells. Fantastic. Now, what we want to cover also, all right, is, well, in the arms race between the human immune system and pathogens, some pathogens 
have found ways to avoid certain defenses. All right. For example, some viruses can downregulate MHC molecules, making it harder for T cells to recognize the presence of an infection. All right. Natural killer cells, however, are able to detect that downregulation of MHC and induce apoptosis in those virally infected cells. These natural killer cells are a type of nonspecific lymphocytes, all right? And they can offer protection from growth, from, from viruses, all right? They can offer protection also from growth of cancer as well, all right? So that's an important type, all right, of cellular response. Natural killer cells, they kill tumor cells and virus infected cells. What is their location? Circulates in blood and migrates into tissue. All right. Now, in addition to macrophages, all right, which we, we which we've talked a little about now. These are phagocytic cells that consume foreign pathogens and cancer cells and then they stimulate response of immune of other immune cells. Um, in addition to that, the the granulocytes includes things like neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, um, and they're all involved in nonspecific defenses. So we also want to cover what those kinds of cells do. All right, these uh, neutrophils, we'll start there, are the most populous leukocytes in blood. Um, they're very short lived. But these cells are phagocytic, like macrophages, and they target bacteria. Neutrophiles can literally follow bacteria using chemotaxis. This is the sensing of certain products given off by bacteria. All right. And migration of neutrophiles to follow these products uh, help locate bacteria so that they can handle that. Neutrophiles can also detect bacteria once they have been marked with an antibody from a B cell. All right, so their first responders at the site of infection are trauma. They're abundant. All right, they release toxins that kill or inhibit bacteria and fungi, and then they recruit, recruit other immune cells to the site of infection. All right, where are, are they found? They migrate from blood vessels into tissue. Beautiful. All right. Now, um, in addition to neutrophiles, we can talk about basophiles. They're responsible for defenses against parasites. Um, they release histamines that cause inflammation and may be responsible for allergic reactions. Um, they circulate in blood and they migrate to tissues. All right. So that is basophiles. They're, um, again, granulocytes. They attack multicellular parasites. They release histamine. Um, and the use of histamine makes basophiles um, key players in mounting an allergic response. All right. Then we have es uh, esophiles. Um, the, uh, they are also granulocytes. They target multicellular parasites. They secrete a range of highly toxic proteins and free radicals that kill bacteria and parasites. The use of toxic proteins and free radicals also causes tissue damage during allergic reactions. So activation and toxin release by esophiles is going to be is highly regulated to prevent any unnecessary tissue damage. All right. So right here releases toxins that kill bacteria and parasite, but also causes tissue damage. Where is where are they found? They circulate in blood, migrate to tissue. All right. Fantastic. Now, we can also talk about um, mast cells, which is all the way up here because we didn't cover that. All right. Mast cells are found in mucous membranes and connective tissue. They are important for wound healing and defense against pathogens via the inflammatory response. So when mast cells are activated, they're going to release cytokines and granules that contain chemical molecules to create an inflammatory cascade, all right? Mediators like histamine cause blood vessels to dilate, which increases blood flow and cell trafficking to the area of infection. And then the cytokines released during this process are gonna act as a messenger service 
alerting other immune cells like neutrophils and macrophages to make their way to the area of infection or to be on alert for circulating threats. All right, so mast cells dilate blood vessels, induce inflammation through release of histamines. They recruit macrophages and nutriophiles that are involved in wound healing and defense against pathogens, but they can also be responsible for allergic reactions. Their location is in connective tissue and mucous membranes. Now, dendritic sites, we've briefly mentioned them, but let's talk about them in more detail. They are antigen-presenting cells that are located in tissues, and they can contact external environments through the skin, the inner mucosal lining of the nose, lungs, stomach, and intestines. Now, since they're located in tissue that are common points for initial infection, they can identify threats and act as messengers for the rest of the immune system by antigen presentation. All right. They also act as bridge between the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. All right, so present antigens on its surface, trigger adaptive immunity. They're present in epithelial tissue, including skin, lung, tissues of the digestive tract, and they can migrate to lymph nodes upon activation. All right, last but not least, we'll cover monocyte. It differentiates into macrophages and dendritic cells in response to inflammation. So it can differentiate into dendritic cells and macrophages they're stored in the spleen they move through blood vessels to infected tissue all right with that all right with that we have covered objective one and objective two now all right so this is kind of where i want to stop for this video i want to just quickly recap because i think that's that that biology the mcat biology in my opinion is is very information dense all right. And it's a lot of memorization as opposed to, say, general chemistry, OCHEM and physics, because you kind of understand a couple ideas, big ideas, and then everything kind of flows from that logic. All right. But I think that biology, there's just so much to memorize. So we're going to just quickly recap what we learned. All right. Repetition is key, especially for things that, you know, subjects that are very information dense, very memory based. All right. We started by saying that the immune system can be divided into innate and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity is composed of defenses that are always active, but that cannot target a specific invader and cannot maintain uh, immune memory. All right. So innate immunity is also called nonspecific immunity. Then we discussed adaptive immunity. This is composed of defenses that take time to activate, but that target a specific invader and can maintain immunity immune memory all right so it's called specific immunity and we said how the immune system is really dis dispersed in the body right immune cells come from the bone marrow the spleen and the lymph nodes are sites where immune responses can be mounted and in which b cells are activated we discussed that the thymus is the site of t cell maturation and we also talked about gut-associated lymphoid tissue that includes the tonsils and adenoids uh, and also leukocytes, white blood cells that are involved in the immune defense. Then we moved into our second objective where we really focused on innate immunity. We said that many of the nonspecific defenses are non-cellular. This includes the skin because it acts as a physical barrier and secretes antimicrobial compounds like de uh, uh, defensins. We talked about the mucus on mucous membranes and how they trap pathogens. In the respiratory system, the mucus is propelled upward by cilia and can be swallowed or expelled. We said that tears and saliva also play a role in non-specific, non-cellular defenses because they, they, they contain lysozyme, which is an antibacterial compound. The stomach also plays a role as it produces acid that kills most pathogens. And the colonization of gut helps prevent overgrowth by pathogenic bacteria through competition. Um, two other things we covered under the category of nonspecific non-cellular defenses are the complement system and interferons. The complement system can punch holes in the cell walls of bacteria, making them osmot uh, uh, os osmotically unstable. And interferons are given off by virally infected cells and can help prevent viral replication and dispersion to nearby cells. Then we moved into talking about 
nonspecific defenses that are cellular. We said macrophages ingest pathogens and present them on major histocompatibility complex molecules. They also secrete cytokines. We said that there's two classes of MHS, class 1 and class 2. Class 1 is present in all nucleated cells and they display endogenous antigens to cyto uh, cytotoxic T cells. And class 2 is presented in professional antigen presenting cells and um, they display exogenous antigens to helper T cells. Then we started to talk about different cell types and their roles in nonspecific cellular defenses. We talked about dendritic cells, their antigen presenting cells in the skin, um, uh, and they trigger adaptive immunity. We talked about natural killer cells that attack cells not presenting MHC molecules, including virally infected cells and cancer cells. We talked about granulocytes like neutrophiles, eosinophiles, and basophiles. All right. Um, neutrophiles are first responders at the site of infection. Um, basophiles are responsible for defenses against parasites and they release histamines that cause inflammation. Eosinophiles release toxins that kill bacteria and parasites but also can cause tissue damage. Then we moved into um, discussing mast cells which dilate blood vessels and induce inflammation through the release of histamines and they also recruit macrophages and neutrophiles. Um, we talked about dendritic cells. They present, ant uh, I already said that, they present antigens on the cell. Oh, um, also, actually, I didn't repeat that. Dendritic cells, they produce, uh, present antigens on the surface. And then mo monocell, uh, monocytes differentiate into macrophages and dendritic cells. All right. And with that, we've summarized everything that we've covered thus far in our immune system chapter. In the next video, we will continue this chapter. We'll talk about adaptive immune system, the adaptive immune system, and we'll also talk about the lymphatic system. All right, let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.